welcome to another edition of Technologic Talk. I'm your host, H.J. Dunmore. Now, this edition of Technologic Talk is a continuation of the foundational series. As technology is changing, I felt it best to provide background information on the logic behind some of the things that we see and use often. Now, I had a question that was asked of me a while back from one of my family members. It was a really good question, and I decided I would share it with you. This is the question that he asked me. He said, how can the same movie that I view in the theater be made so that it's available for download off the internet? Now, download off the internet, we're referring to iTunes or something of that sort where I can download a movie. He said, I mean a Blu-ray disc or a DVD I can understand, but for the iPod, how is that possible? Now, that's a very good question. And there's a long scientific, mathematical, and theory-based response that probably would take the length of a miniseries to complete. There is also a condensed version that gets straight to the point and it brings clarity to what may seem to be a difficult process. What I'm going to do is provide a mixture of the two, a condensed version that touches on some of the key points from the process, and it gives you a good understanding of what we're gonna be talking about. Video files, they have to be reduced from their original size in order to fit on the iPod, and yes, even a DVD. Even DVDs and Blu-ray videos are not of the original, rich video quality that you probably viewed in the theater. Now here's a question that you might ask. How is video compressed on DVD when the picture looks so good? Well, here's the answer. One word, compression. So what is video compression? Compression is discarding of information from a video or an audio file in order to reduce overall file size. So the next question that you might ask is, in this compression, what information is discarded? Well, there are many components that can be discarded from a file and are discarded from a file. But overall, these components can be divided into four categories. These four categories of video compression are frame, picture, color, and sound. We learned in a previous video that the majority of your television broadcasts consist of 30 frames per second. YouTube, for example, broadcasts video at 25 frames per second. Now by discarding just those five frames per second, I've already reduced the overall size of my video file. Now many of your live video streams, such as Skype or live stream, Justin TV, those are 15 frames per second, which is already a reduction of nearly half of those original 30 frames. I have to let you in on the main idea of video compression, the main objective. This objective is indeed to reduce file size, but the second and probably what would be the main objective is to make sure that your eyes and your ears can't tell the difference from the original file. Now, good compression is removing information from a file and the result is that you can't tell the difference between the original and the compressed file. So, let me say that again. If you can't tell the difference, that means that your compressionist did a very good job. All right, the second category is picture. Now, in our previous TV resolution episode, I introduced the term freeze frame. A freeze frame is the pausing of moving video, which results in the view resting on one frame. Now, the computer reviews video in slow motion. It looks at each frame individually. And the computer goes through a process of compare and contrast. It reviews and it takes notes of the elements that are similar and those that are different. Let me say that one more time. The computer takes an internal snapshot, just like that of a camera, of what's happening, and it only takes note of the new changes that are taking place. Now, this memorization makes the process much easier since each frame does not have to be repeated. And the result, well, it reduces the overall file size, which makes it even easier to upload. Now, the technical term for this is called inter-frame compression. The third category is color. Now, an image is separated into two categories, luminance, or brightness, and chrominance, or color. Now, the human eye, our eyes, are quite sensitive to brightness. I mean, we can tell when a picture is bright or dim you know, or light or dark, we can tell. But when it comes to color, our eyes handle images a little different. Now, let's use uh, a group of crayons, for example. Now, you have different colors. You have mint green, forest green, asparagus green, and shamrock green, to name a few. Now, these are all shades of green, and they're all noticeably different to the average human eye. Now, let's take a look at another set of colors. We have pine green, spring green, and crocodile green. Now, as you can see, these all colors, all of them are quite the same, and the human eye can't differentiate 
as easily. It can't tell them apart as easily as perhaps the last set of colors that we were looking at. So what will happen in compression is that these similar colors, well, they'll pick one color, and then outside of that, the rest of the colors are discarded. And this one color, well, this color will be the one that represents that entire range of colors. Now, this is obviously just working with the color green, but when you're working with colors in compression, you're working with millions of colors. Now, the last category is sound. Sound can be divided into three categories as well. Now, these categories would be frequencies. The frequencies are high mid frequency, mid frequency, and low frequency. Now, a low frequency sound would be the equivalent of, let's say, a bass guitar, or even a kick from a drum. Now, a high frequency sound would be the sound of a bird chirping, or perhaps a whistle being blown. Now, the sound of a person speaking generally falls in the mid-range. Now, many males, such as myself, the lower tones would be more of a low mid-range. And in a woman, if they're talking higher, that would be more of a high mid-range. Now, audio that consists of a person talking in mid-range is much different than, say, the sound of a full band. Now, let's use a circle, for example. Now, let's say that the full band playing takes up this much space inside of the circle. Now, talking, on the other hand, may take up a little bit less. Let's say, for example, maybe 40% of that entire space. Now, in both cases, we would discard any of that space that's not necessary, just as we would when we're compressing video. And by doing that, we've already reduced some of the file size. Now, let's say, for example, a CD. Now, we know that a CD that you may buy from the store is really high in quality and also in file size. But if we take that CD and we reduce the size or the amount of audio by reducing those low, mid, and high range pieces that we don't need, well, we can create an MP3 file that can be compressed and it can be downloaded or emailed. So we've learned that by reducing the four categories, your frame, your picture information, your color information, and your sound, all four of those together, you've actually compressed your video. You've eliminated the things that aren't necessarily noticeable to the average person. And by doing that, now we have a video file that can be uploaded to YouTube. It can be applied onto a DVD. It can be sent to a mobile phone. And then now we actually have video that we can send our great projects, our great memories, all those things to people even on different sides of the world. And that's the beauty of video compression. Now, some of you can probably remember back when the way we wanted to send a video, we probably would take a VHS tape and stick it in the mail and send it to someone and have them give us a call. But now we can actually get on a Skype and we can send the video to that person live and we can talk and chat to them. And this compression has made this possible. And it's such an awesome thing. I'd like to thank you for viewing another edition of Technologic Talk. Again, my name is H.J. Dunmore. It's been a pleasure talking to you and even securing even stronger foundation and understanding how this technology works. Now, as always, if you have any questions relating to video technology, I love technology and of course I love to talk. So feel free to email me. The email address is info at technologictalk.com and the website address is technologictalk.com. So once again, I thank you. Always feel free, any questions, any ideas, always feel free to email it to me. And remember, I love technology and I love to talk and I love technologic talk. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your day.